I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not, that is not me. I, yeah. I cried so much. <laughs> I probably haven't cried that much since I was a baby. I cried, I was snappy, I was horrible to my boyfriend, I was horrible to my family. I didn't sleep properly, but I still overall really enjoyed the process and I learned so much. Too many people think I'm gonna be an entrepreneur, I wanna put CEO in my in my bio and Instagram and I wanna be director of and it's like but for what? For what? Yeah, yeah the money I earn, I, I'd have to have a company turning over our Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Property by Kazi podcast. With myself, Kaz, each and every week we have an amazing special guest. Today I have Meg, aka That Property Girl. How are you doing? I'm good, Kazi. Thank you for having me today. It's a little bit of a fight to get you on. You wasn't sure if you wanted to come on in the yeah, first place. Yeah, I was a little bit nervous, a little bit apprehensive, but no, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad nah, I'm here. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be. So <laughs> I always think where to start, because it's like, do we start at the beginning? Do we start at the end? So I think... My question for you, I guess, as a starting point is why property? Well, we're gonna have to start at the beginning, I guess, for, for property. So I, I kind I kind of got into property by accident, a little mm. bit by accident. Um I'd started my career and we can talk about that in a bit. I started my career, I'd started working in law, decided I wanted to do marketing, moved into um oh, during that time I bought my first place mm. and I loved I just love looking at properties. I love going on the viewings, I love looking on right move, I loved going into a space and changing it and making it something else. And from then I was just like, I need to be involved in property. I need to So let's talk involved. about that, buying your first place. How were you able to do that and where, where was the property? So I suppose rewind back to the start. I did pretty well in school. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, GCSEs, I did yeah pretty well in my GCSEs. Moving on to my A-levels, I went for a pretty rough time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a difficult time, went through some personal bits and pieces and I didn't get to finish my AS levels. Didn't really know what I wanted to do with myself, quite artistic. I went and studied art for a year, realised I didn't want to do that as a career. And then one of my friends, I was a bit lost, you know, all of my friends had gone off to uni. They were making things in themselves. I didn't know what to do. And my boyfriend at the time, his sister was like, I'm going to train as a legal secretary. I was like, do you know what? That Sounds like something I can do. I wanted to keep moving. I was in a bad place, but I knew I had to keep keep moving. Um, so I went and trained as a legal secretary. Um, and they put me on work experience at one of the biggest law firms in the world. Oh, wow. Based in Canary Wharf. So I went there on a three-week work experience. And at the time, I was at uh, college for four days a week. Mm -hmm. And then I said to them, I said, look, can I just come back the day that I'm off? Mm -hmm. Can I just come back? So I just, I just went and worked there. I got my travel paid for. I got my um, lunches paid for. And that was it. I wasn't getting a salary. I wasn't getting getting paid. And that turned into a seven-year career. So I didn't go to uni. I didn't, I suppose, I started working, started saving earlier on. Mm -hmm. So I, that that allowed me to buy a property. At the time, I was with a guy who was very financially savage, savage shall we say. He, you know, he, he was very good at saving mm -hmm. and he encouraged me to do the same. And I just saved hard. Um, so I bought my first place at 23. Oh, wow. Uh, that was in Wanstead in East London um, with my partner. That lasted for a month. And then we split up and I ended up taking the mortgage on myself. So I went from, yeah, living at home with my parents, paying nothing to having this mortgage on my own and and working and having to, yeah. Do There's some that. interesting things you touched on then. Um, that idea of the transition from, well, everybody's at school, you know, everybody kind of maybe goes to college together to then being at a point where you've got some friends that have been maybe working from leaving school. So they've got four years of experience and a climbing the yeah. ladder. You've got some friends that have just graduated on grad schemes, some people that are maybe entrepreneurs. And I think a lot of people at that point find life can be a little bit difficult because you can feel like you're getting left behind. Is that I guess, but that was a point where you sort of pushed on and you had somebody that was good around you that kind of inspired you to go down a specific route. Yeah, so I, the difficulty in my life was I was in a really abusive relationship and I just hit rock bottom. I was completely depressed. I mean, there was a period of time where I just, I couldn't leave the house. Um, I, I really, really struggled. And thankfully my parents, fantastic. They, you know, around me, they supported me and they were the ones that encouraged me just to keep moving mm -hmm. in whichever direction I needed to, but just keep pushing forward. And even at my worst point, 
I still went to work. I remember my dad saying to me once, he said, even at your absolute depths, you still got up and went mm-hmm. to work. And work for me has always been something I think that brings me joy. It makes, yeah, it, it brings me a lot. It, it fulfills me. And that was something that I kept, I kept pushing forward. And from there, I just kept taking opportunities, but it was hard, you know, going back to your point about being left behind. I had two groups of friends. I had these friends that went off to uni mm-hmm. and then I had these friends that went and worked as like PAs in the city and were making, you know, 25 at the time, 25, 30 grand a year. And I was just stuck feeling lost. Like, um, and it was hard, but thankfully my parents pushed me through and the opportunities were there and I, and I took them. I think, yeah, I think a testament, obviously a testament to your parents for being there, to you for being strong enough to be able to actually, like when you felt able to communicate with people, because I think a lot of the time we can feel very isolated, like we're going through things alone, like it's just me. And we'll, we'll touch on that in the property space, but yeah. sometimes when you see the Instagram world, all you yeah. see is everybody with keys and GDV numbers. Yeah. You think, is it only me that my builders didn't turn up to work today? <laughs> so, um, but I think sometimes being able to share the reality of life as a mm-hmm. whole is really good. But I think the further thing is a testament is actually keeping going, whether it be in personal life, work struggles, in and out of property. I think actually having consistent movement means, and I use this example of like being in a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Like if you're struggling in the swimming pool and all you're doing is staying still, like treading water, eventually you're going to drown. Whereas if you push yourself in a direction, it might not be the side you actually want to get to, but at least you'll get there, get some respite. And then when you feel ready, be able to sort of go again. And I think maybe that's a good sort of message to people that maybe are sort of struggling a little bit. Just try and do something, even if it's not that your be all and end all goal. Mm-hmm. Do something, stay active, and you know, then hopefully you can find more direction going forward. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly it. And as you said, whether it's you know your personal life, whether you're suffering from depression, mm-hmm. anxiety, whether you're going through a really tough project, as I was mm-hmm. last year, and thinking yeah. there's you know there's not the end is not in sight. I don't know how I'm going to get through this break it down take take each day at a time okay i've got through this day okay i just have to do that again tomorrow i have to break it down into small pieces and for me i think writing things down all this stuff in your head head sometimes on a piece of paper feels so much more manageable and 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 yeah Yeah. digestible and i think that that's simplifying it you know struggling in in any form is, is is very complex and complicated mm-hmm. but yeah that would be my advice is is i've been there i've struggled and the thing that kept me going was yeah just mm-hmm. pushing forward even if it was at slow pace yeah so like yeah pushing forward doing things at your own time breaking down what seems like massive tasks because mm-hmm. and it works in the property space renovating a home is like wow yeah. I've got to do everything. I've got electrics, plumbing, central heating, yeah. like plastering, the roof. The, that, the, But it's like you don't do it all at once. You do it in bits and writing things down so you can free up that mental space to not think I've got to just remember everything. Yeah. Sometimes like I, I think I used to struggle with like I would get to the point where I would be like I feel like I would be struggling with like anxiety because I'm trying to remember so many things and I'm conscious that I don't want to let these people down. I don't mm-hmm. want to do this. I don't want to do that. So I'm trying to do everything. There's sometimes you have to be able to, whether it's writing stuff down, whether it's taking on or working with somebody, whether it's employing somebody, but trying to find ways to actually look after yourself as well as just the projects and the people around you. Yeah. And I think it's also communication, mm. communicating to people. If you feel like you're letting da- people down or you're going to disappoint people quite often saying to somebody, Hey, listen, look, I know I said I'd do that this week, but can I do that next week? And quite often the answer is, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. And, and you build it up in, mm-hmm. up in your head. And I've done that on, on so many occasions where I'm like, in my head, this feels like a big thing. And I go and, you know, they always say like a problem shared is a problem half. Yeah. And it, it, it often is. And I think it's hard, but like, you know, last year when I was going through my, my refurb and my builder was letting me down and he was running off with my money and I was fast approaching the ed- end of my bridge. And I just, I can't talk to anyone. I can't mm-hmm. admit how much this is affecting me. And that's why I disappeared. I mean, you said, where did you go? You yeah. were at these events and all of a sudden you stopped turning up. I was just like, I can't be in a space where people are going to ask me, how's it going? Because I'm not ready to admit that. Yeah, <laughs> I think not, I don't know if this is, I'm not ready to have those conversations. Um, but like in other stages of my life, got through it with 
support of other people, whether that's mental, financial, emotional, whatever it is. But yeah, I went and had to go and ask for help. I got it and here I am, you know. That's it. Yeah, I definitely think that communication thing, like sometimes it's on both sides. It's like sometimes all you got to do is pick up the phone and say, right now I'm slammed. I know I said I'd get it done this week. Yeah but it's going to have to be Monday. That's going to stop that same person from calling you five times in that week. You thinking, oh, I'm letting people down. I think just managing expectations in mm-hmm. all walks of life is important. But let's get back. So 23, again, you have to clap 23, buying your first property, buying it in London as well. I think for a lot of people out there that are maybe they hear all oh, because of prices have gone up so much mm-hmm. and, you know, it's not affordable. Things are always going to be, things are always going to be hard for a reason. Yeah. And there's always going to be reasons that have made them slightly easy. And it's your real job as an entrepreneur, as an investor, a business person to find how you make things work. So whether that means buying with a partner, a sibling, a friend, Mm -hmm. using different schemes, but there's, there's going to be opportunities out there that are going to make it viable. And I remember having, it's probably like five months ago, having a conversation with a couple, Mm -hmm. both working in McDonald's, both supervisors in McDonald's, both working that were thinking, oh, we just wanted to know how far away they were from being able to buy a property. Mm-hmm. But they'd saved a decent amount, um, had a conversation. They couldn't get their dream home, but they got like a nice one bedroom flat above commercial, could still get a loan mm-hmm. on it and got, were able to get on the ladder. So your first one, you said you really enjoyed this renovation project. What, what was it like or what was the whole? Do you, I, 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 do you know what I think it was? I think it was the fact that I'd been quite down for a mm-hmm. long period, period of time and I loved creating a space that I felt safe in and mm-hmm. I felt comfortable in. And I think that sort of fed into my current role um, in my sort of nine to five job and also my investment journey, creating mm-hmm. spaces for people that feel like home. Mm-hmm. Um, just just the ability to do that, create this environment that feels a certain way and, and talks to certain people. And in my case, that was myself. But that... so What was your favourite part of your, your renovation of your own home? I think it was just knowing that I did it. I mean, I'm pretty handsy. So I did some of the wallpapering, mm-hmm. and some of the painting, the stripping, choosing things. I think it did a lot for my self, self-esteem, self just knowing that, that this is mine. You did this. This is mine. I did this. You know, I bought my lovely floor in and I chose the colours and, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's nice. And just having that space that was mine, it was just, it felt it felt so nice. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the good things about property because it's tangible yeah. like you go through the stress of like whether it be builders whether it be solicitors whether it be agents but you have these amazing milestones of i'm here so whether yeah. it's the i collected the keys moment we just spoke to somebody last week that said the moment they felt like they were buying a property at auction and it froze and they didn't know and then it was just like computer come back on <laughs> they said you won and it was like a, it yeah, was I've like those moments of elation where just like i've actually done it and i, I can imagine just after going through a difficult time and doing the work yourself and then creating that space where maybe it's just you sit down and there's like a little angle where you're like, oh, I just love how this has all come together and it's the, I did this moment. Yeah, and it's funny, I'm still in the same place t- 10 mm. years later mm. or whatever it is. And obviously I've made changes over mm. the years and improvements and stuff, but I still walk in I just walk into my living room and I'm like, I just love this space. I just love this space. Like this mm. is mine. It just feels, it. it's safe, it's comfortable, it's... It, yeah, it means a lot to me and I, I love it. That's nice. So, so you bought property and then at what point in time, in terms of your, your nine to five, mm. did you transition into working in, in the property space? So I went from, so I was working in a law firm. I spent seven years there. And then during that time, I, I'd, as I said, I, I started on a three-week work experience, went back as a legal secretary, mm-hmm. and then a role came up working for the managing partner and the COO, the global mm-hmm. um, the global team, as an assistant PA. And it came up on, on the company intranet. I thought, I'm going to go for that. And I remember when I first started training as a legal secretary and I got this, this position, my mum said, look, it's great. I said, but just manage your expectations. You're going into this law firm that's got its own swimming pool. It's got a gym. It's got squash courts. It's mm-hmm. it's got hairdressers. It's got dry cleaners. Everything. She said, just just manage your expectations that your first job might have to be, you know, for example, above a chicken shop in a high street solicitors. So I went for this job and I got it, and I could not believe it. I mean, this girl from East London, no A levels, no degree. Um, at the time, far more of a Cockney accent than I have now. Going into this, this big world of just, just, just felt 
completely unreachable. Um, so yeah, I did, I did seven years there. And as I said, I'd bought my, I bought my place, loved it. During that time, I tra- transitioned over to working with the communications team, mm-hmm. global communications, PR, and then slowly into marketing. So I bought my place. I was like, I love property. Mm-hmm. Realized I'd love marketing. Started studying marketing on top of work. So there were times when I was up at 5 a.m., I was in the gym, I was working 10 hour days and coming home and doing my, all of the, like the reading, the mm-hmm. coursework, everything for my thing. And I was just thought, I'm going to go to property. So I started looking for jobs. Actually, one of the ladies I worked with, her husband worked at, again, one of the biggest um, property companies in the world, put a word in for me. They were looking for a marketing manager and I jumped over and I spent three years there, 2016, just as Brexit was announced. Um, So it's a good move for me. But no, it was, and that's where, yeah, that's where my property journey started, I guess, sort of, yeah, eight years ago. And how did you, how have you found it since? Like what's in terms of what have you got to do? What have you got to work on? What's some of the, the upsides of working, you know, in property, you know, in a nine to five? Um, working property. I mean, as I said, it's tangible. So I went from working in law, which there was, there was, yeah, I just felt like there was nothing to show for it. It wasn't particularly interesting from a marketing point of view. And then going over to property, it's like you get to these properties, you know, it, it you aspire to be in some of these properties. Um, and initially I worked sort of estate agency side Mm -hmm. and then a few years in, I started working with one of our more boutique clients. So I was based in the West end. Eventually I was working on sort of four to 20 unit developments, but boutique and Mm -hmm. talking like, you know, two, three million pound upwards. Mm -hmm. And I started working with one of the boutique clients. Um, and I got made redundant. They served me with sort of redundancy. And this was the second time this had happened. I was like, oh gosh, what do I do? What do I do? So I called this client and I said, do you want to meet for a coffee? Got to coffee, met with her. And I said, I'm looking for a job. She said, I'm looking for a marketing manager. And that was it. That was it. You know, the, the connection there, I'd, yeah. I'd worked with her on her brand, um, on, on, the, on the development and it worked. And that's when I transitioned over to the developer side of things, which for me is just the place that I love to be. I love to be on that developer side. Um, you know, creating the brand, creating the interiors, working out, you know, the positioning of the product, how it's going to look, how it's going to feel, how you communicate and sell that into people. Um, So I worked at that job and then I moved into the role that I currently am in now, um, heading communications, marketing, placemaking across the UK for a European developer. And yeah, that's, that's kind of how, how it happened. Um, It wasn't, through any planning there was no you know there's no vision board for me there was no five-year plan I'm not like that I just work hard hard. it's Mm. it's cheesy to say but the the harder I work the luckier I get yeah um and I always say to my mum and dad I'm I'm so lucky can I tell you something yeah yeah yeah. literally I think by the last one I was like I'm not gonna say it this time because we've said that same thing for like the last four episodes which is like luck favors the proactive and the hard working yeah you know, I, I think it, it's just, it does. Like ev- everybody has this, generally speaking, has the same sentiment that across the board, you wouldn't have had those opportunities had you been sitting in your house or had you not been up and about and doing things. And I, 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 I absolutely agree. And as I said, you know, these opportunities have come up and I've just run with them. And whether mm-hmm. it was my first job where I'm having to, you know, go and photocopy 50 sheets of paper and done it with a smile on my face. Yeah, cool. Like, let's get it done. Let's come in a little bit earlier, work a little bit later. Let's, let's do this. And I think I remember being at the law firm and we would do internships and we had some students coming from Oxford and we were paying them, I don't know, two, 300 pound a week, which at the time was a lot of money. It's probably similar to my salary Mm -hmm. at the time. And they came in, they, I didn't want to work hard. It had been through, they had these connections that had put mm-hmm. them there and things like that. And I remember going to my manager at the time, um, who was the head of global communications, incredible woman. And one of one of the people that, um, I sort of attribute my success to, and I said, where I come from, there are people that would kill for this opportunity to mm-hmm. come in here, even for free to get this name on their CV. And we've got two people out there that sit and watching BBC iPlayer and can't be asked, And it changed after that. They, they stopped inviting those sort of people in and then they opened up a more social mobility thing. And I think 
there some people that always succeed because of who they are, who they're related to and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But there's some people that don't take opportunities and the people that do, I think generally succeed. Did, did you ever find that you, you suffered for like imposter syndrome at all in that, like obviously you're being in these places where like you're looking up at this building, and you're like, I know this is worth a good sort of hundred million plus. Mm. Like you said, squash courts, tennis courts, sauna, all these things, working in the West End. And you mentioned, obviously, girl from East London. Did you ever feel like, I don't know if I fit in, I don't know if I belong here in places, and how did you deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you speak to my brother and my family and stuff, and you hear the accents Mm. of my family and the accent that I used to have, and I've had to change that over the years. But absolutely, I remember coming home to my mum once and going, people actually say, yeah. So I heard someone for the first time, I'm, like, I'm not lying, for the first time, someone said, yeah, and they were serious. I was like, what is this? Um, and I remember a time, and I was still quite junior, and one of the, I think, senior people was leaving. So I was going around to all of the partners doing a collection. I went into, the, into someone's office, one of the partner's offices. He said, so who are you then? So I'm Megan, I'm, you know, communications team assistant. What university did you go to? I didn't go to university. So how did you get here? And at the time I wasn't, you know, as assertive as I am now or as confident. I just, I said, cause I work hard. I'm good at, and I'm good at what I do. And he sort of looked at me, yeah. nodded. And, but I, I do all the time, even to this, to this day, I, I, I stand in work sometimes and I look at the developments that I'm working on. We're talking about thousands of homes, you know, hundreds of thousands of square foot of office space, public realm, like, working on projects that are going to change neighborhoods, communities, in cases, some cases cities. And I get to be a part of that and I get to contribute to that. And I'm just like, it's just, this, you know, little girl from East London doing yeah. that, but I can, and I am. And yeah, it's, it's sometimes, it's, it's just unbelievable sometimes to me. I'm still like. No, I think, I think that, that is the one thing about property that, you know, is, for me is always really exciting is the fact that you get an opportunity to leave your mark on on a city basically Mm -hmm. whether it be a small scale development or a large scale development but you get to have an impact and you know these buildings stand the test of time yeah we look at victorian buildings that have now been around for 120 some of them up to like 150 years you know if you do good work and have an impact that can have an impact on you know a a family's like you said in their in their living conditions or just Mm -hmm. in terms of like the landscape of an area for a long period of time. I think that one of the, the nicest messages that I ever got was, um, I bought this little, they call it like a, a cottage style house. So it's, mm-hmm. it's a semi-detached cottage, um, typically like two bedrooms and bought it, did a nice like rear extension, but it was further out than I normally operate. So just on the sort of borders of London mm-hmm. and Surrey and then um, Chessington. Yeah. And it was like quiet, bought it for like 200,000, did like a full refurb, rear extension. I think even with that as a as a house, it's still sold for like four hundred and fifty thousand. And I got a message from like someone on Instagram say, "Oh yeah, we bought that house that you did." You know, and you're thinking, oh, like, what does that do? Yeah, yeah. We're like, you're gonna tell me like two years down the line, the brain always that, oh, blocks. By the way, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. exactly, there's a brain block. <laughs> I was thinking, okay, but do you know what I mean? As as like having a public presence, you people have access. And I said, that's mm-hmm. fine. So, so I said, oh, just have you got, um, it's like, um, there's an issue with the fridge. Have you got a copy of the warranty? And I was like, oh yeah, do you know, I've just gone to the files, sent them over the PDF. So like, oh, that's so great. And it's like, can I just say, like, we still pinch ourselves that we can't live, that we live in somewhere this nice. And it's like, sometimes when like landlords or property personnel get a bad name, but like a lot of us actually have a genuine passion of creating nice homes. Yeah. And, <clears throat> I think whenever I'm delivering something, you touched on it briefly of your project that we're going to go on to, it's like, I always think, okay, if I was living here, what would I want? Mm-hmm. Like, obviously within financial reasons, sometimes I'd yeah, love a swimming yeah. pool, but <laughs> it's not in the budget, but what would I want? And I think the people that tend to succeed in property, like with longevity, tend to have that in mind, like looking at the end user as a real customer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, I think there's this new wave of property investors and I'm loving it. I'm not against, you know, legislation, regulations, mm-hmm. um, particularly when it comes to the sort of standard, standard of living. So mm-hmm. I think there are probably these older investors who sort of swept up mm-hmm. property in the eighties and stuff and mm-hmm. haven't, haven't given it the care potentially. And maybe that's, you know, 
blankety yeah. and then yeah, there's no, a stereotype. I think, I think the new age, young, yeah, you know, investors, yeah. um, we do care more. We do care more. And, and, and we see, we're more I, passionate about it from the people that I know and the people I've met. I think it's the way in which we view or the collectively tenants are viewed. Mm. Whereas previously, like tenants were viewed as that was a specific word that just was delegated to somebody living in your house. Yeah. Whereas now I think there's very much the word tenant and customer are a lot more interchangeable. Yeah. Mm. In that, you know, because of large build to rent schemes that have in-house maintenance, that have the concierge, have, you know, people, it's like almost like living in a boutique hotel. You yeah. make a call, you're expecting a response in hours mm -hmm. and a resolution yeah. within 24 hours sort of thing. Um, and I think those standards of the build to rent accommodation have spread into the general rental standards. And whilst there has been, you know, from some landlords complaints about the, you know, the landlord tenant acts and potential changes, mm -hmm. I think with any changes become opportunities. And if you're ahead of the curve in terms of the standard of service that you're delivering, those that fall short, may decide to exit the market which presents opportunities and if you're already in place then it's not going to affect yeah. you and if some people exit the market it means that your your property is now going to be more valuable so i think that there's some good opportunities for good landlords definitely regardless of changes in legislation yeah i think so and i think it can only it can only improve things for for tenants and you know there's always these articles about the amount of landlords selling up mm -hmm. and exiting and and stuff like that and i do think these are people that have been in the game for sort of 20 30 years they don't want to go back and do the work they don't want to compete with the sort of stuff that we're bringing to market now and as, as you said if if you're genuinely good at your game and you're genuinely passionate about it and you want to do the right thing as a landlord as a developer you know in that sense you're going to win there's going to be opportunity mm -hmm. there you know properties is it's one of the oldest things in the game it's exactly people are always people are always going to need a roof over their heads and exactly. they're not making new land in england it's, it's not the buy unfortunately we're no. not just getting a brand, <laughs> brand new cities every every second quarter okay so in terms of that's your work life what you were mm -hmm. doing in terms of nine to five before we go on to the development side of things i just want to touch on something i saw you post about recently which is kind of like yeah i'm never leaving my nine to five really. yeah because yeah. a lot of people have this, I want to be like, you know, their people's primary thing is, yeah, I want to be self-employed. I want to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. Why for you do you prefer the structure and enjoy, you know, the, the nine to five space? Um, I think, I mean, I love structure. Like you said, I love structure. I love structure. I've done my Myers-Briggs and it will tell me that I, I love structure. Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, I... For one, I love my job that I'm in now. It has given me so much experience, not just on the property side of things. It's dealing with people. It's it's shown me the type of manager and leader that I do want to be, the type of manager and leader that I don't want to be. Um, I've made good friends. Mm -hmm. It's it's nice to get up every day and go and be surrounded by people. I think being an entrepreneur is quite can be quite lonely. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me it works, and I've been fortunate enough worked hard enough, been lucky enough, however you want to position it, to have a very successful career. For me, I earn good money. I love what I do. Why why would I throw all of that away mm. to to go it alone when I actually can do both? I'm in a really fortunate position that I can do both. I can invest. I can I can build my portfolio at the same time as working. I just think there's so much to be said for understand how business works you know even just the financial accounting thing i manage uh, um i manage a budget of over a million pounds mm -hmm. imagine if i just hadn't had any of that experience and just went out and started trying to manage you know a 300 grand build or whatever it is it's all of those transferable skills and it doesn't work for some people but if you're not willing to work hard in that corporate world are you going to be willing to work hard outside of it i think that there's a misconception a lot of the time that like, doing your own thing just means I've got all the time in the world or I've got no boss. Whereas for me, like I've learned very quickly that doing your own thing means you've got even less time than when you were working mm -hmm. and you're recumbent to like so many different people that are indirectly your boss. Because if you don't do something for a customer, yeah. you don't get paid. If you don't yeah. do something for a supplier, like, you know, they're not vice versa so mm -hmm. it's just there's a lot to it and i think a lot of people sometimes become entrepreneurs for the, the wrong reasons uh, and there's a quite a public 
bashing, which I don't like of the nine to five, because it's great for so many reasons. You get paid, you learn, you mention a social side, but like you, mistakes are less costly in a nine to five and somebody's paying you to have access to all this experience. Good companies have training programs where you can grow your skill set, meet yep. new people, like free networking. So I think there's loads of benefits and it really, like with any decision that you make, I think it's very personal. So I just say like for those that are currently, you know, in work and looking to get into property, it's sort of, for me, it's always one of those things where you, oops, <laughs> apologies. Um, it's one of those things where do whatever works for you. But like, don't get sucked into a 30 second reel saying you should do this because of this, because there's no such thing as one size fits all. And it's all going to be personal circumstance driven. And I'll be the first person to put my hands up and say, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not. That is not me. I'm just strategic. Sorry, you could bring an idea to me, a concept, and I could help you plan it out and roll it out. But I'm not an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I don't have the risk appetite. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't take those risks. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with saying Oh, I'm a corporate girly. That's that's. I'm a corporate girly. I'm, I can build my portfolio. I can have you know a diverse investment portfolio, and eventually one day I might be in a position where I feel comfortable enough to take that risk. But it's a calculated risk. It's a measured risk. It's mm. something that I've been learning over that time. And I, I think too many people think I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I want to put CEO in my in my bio and Instagram, and I want to be director of. And it's like, but for what? For what? Yeah. Like, and. Yeah, the money I earn, my I'd have to have a company turning over a lot of money. A good amount. I it. get my health insurance. I get my life assurance. I get, you know, all of this stuff that I get. I get to travel every month. I get all of this stuff that, again, is part of my package. Ten percent pension. Yeah, for me yeah. to for me to set up a business that's going to give me all of up. that, it's going to have to be a pretty big business. But beside that, you have still. Gone yes. into, into business. <laughs> yeah. Might not be the the but it's you've gone into business, yeah. you've gone in and you've twenty twenty two, I believe you started yeah. your first project. And am I right in saying it's in is it in East London or Essex? No, it's right. in Kent actually. Kent. Yeah, focusing in Kent. Mm -hmm. Focusing in Kent. And I think from conversation, there were changes in the plans. Like initially you were considering a flat conversion, uh, which then pivoted into a HMO conversion. Is that right? Yeah, the other way around. I wobbled okay. halfway through the okay. project. I had a wobble. I um, It was HMO. Mm. It was going to be a six-bed HMO. And then we realized we couldn't really go into the loft. I didn't want to go into planning on my first project. I didn't mm. want to deal with planning at work and know the issues that come with that. So all under PD, five bed, and halfway through, I just... Yeah, I just wobbled. I just I just realized how big a job it was. It was a complete back to brick mm. refurb, structural issues. It was it was huge. And I just I wobbled and it probably cost me four or five grand to start making the changes and pushing it towards flats. I didn't get the plan in the end anyway, so luckily enough I didn't, you know, push forward with that and reverted back to mm. the HMO. Um I think the lesson I learned from that is you've made a decision for a reason, stick with it. Like mm -hmm. trust that decision decision that you made, especially if you're like me and you've done months and months and research and you've done all of this stuff, trust your decision and just stick with it and run with it because all it did was cost me time and money. Yeah. And you're now, are you finished now? I'm finished. finished. I'm finished. Full occupancy or where are you? No, it went onto the market two weeks ago. Okay. So we're just going through the through the stages of through sort the stages, of, yeah, yeah, it's had quite a lot of interest, good feedback. So yeah, yeah just, nice. so just finalizing things now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, waiting for that first uh and what sort of what sort of flair, what sort of design did you put into your HMO car? I know you was, was talking about wanting to make it this the home. So how, what sort of individual personality did you give it on your side yeah do you know what? i mean there's people in the hmo game that do incredible stuff and obviously they they they've got it down to a t um i wouldn't say i did any, anything anything wild i tried to make it sort of easily maintainable so in the kitchens bathroom and stuff i didn't put tiles i just put sort of splashback type things mm. but yeah colors nice furniture a good feel i probably could have squeezed another bedroom into the ground floor but i wanted that communal space i felt like if people could feel like it was their home that they could spend more time there hopefully they'd stay there for longer and look after it a bit more mm -hmm. so for me i designed it on the basis of would i want to live here mm -hmm. Okay. And that was that was kind of it for me. Would I be happy to live here? Would I feel comfortable? Would I feel safe? Would I enjoy living here? And yeah, that that was basically the reason why. It was the colours that I liked, the furniture that I liked and everything like that. Yeah. It was And obviously bearing in mind 
East London girl. Yep. What, where Kent, where Folkestone, what was the decision? How did you find the property? So when I, f so Folkestone, my parents own a caravan in mm -hmm. a place called Dimchurch. It's about 20 minutes down the road from uh, Folkestone. And I spent all of my summer um, Easter holidays there as a kid. And I know the area really well. So that, that was that was one of the areas. I Before I started probably looking, everybody, yeah, go and invest up north, go and invest up north. Mm -hmm. Everyone will tell you, yep, yeah, you know, you need to be up up in the northeast. Again, you know, not wanting to take too much risk. I started working with the hard hat developers, so Priya and Jasmine. Yeah, yeah, nice. Started having a conversation with them, found out that they did coaching. And I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do, despite being in property for, you know, six years mm -hmm. now there's still something that I need to learn before I can, I can take that job. So I started working with them and they helped me identify an area and it basically came down to what could I afford? How far was I willing, will, to, willing travel, to travel yeah. and what, what was my strategy? And I identified Folkestone, you know, it's less than an hour from London. It's somewhere that I can get down to in an hour and 20 minutes mm -hmm. if, if there were any issues and there were plenty of those so i'm glad i'm glad i wasn't you know up in the northeast yeah. where i was like you know working working weeks being away you know all week uh with work and then having to spend my weekends down in folkestone so i'm glad i didn't listen to people and they helped me work out who the right target audience was for that for that uh hmo so i mean that was the best money i've ever spent probably including this investment on on coaching i yeah. think i think sometimes with, with the coaching side of things and that like you said, you're coming from at that point in time, six years experience in property, but it's just the confidence to kind of, for somebody to give, just to have to give you a second opinion. Sometimes it's even just for them to say, actually, you're already on the right track. You, yeah. What you know is good. Yeah. Because if you don't get that, it's that feedback loop of, I think it is, but if I don't, I'm going to be second guessing myself. And then when you do run into issues, you have that sounding board of, look, this is what I've come with these are the issues that I'm facing and what do you think? Yeah. And, and it, it's funny to me because people always think, you know, three, five, 10 grand on, mm. I guess, learning self-improvement coaching or whatever feels like a lot of money to people, but you're going to make far more expensive mistakes do you know what's than really that money. Weird? Like, I'm on the other side. I think it's a lot of money. It's like when people ask me to mentor them and I'm always kind of like, oh, like, I'd love to, but it's like, it's too expensive. Like, cause yeah. I know like what I could do with my time. Yeah. But then I get people like, no, that's fine. Like, I don't mind paying it. And I'm like, are you sure you need it? Like, I'm almost like the opposite. I'm yeah, like the worst yeah. salesman in the world. I'm like, nah, <laughs> go on, you, you don't need it, do you? But it's, I guess it's just finding that person or people that work for you. Mm -hmm. So outside of obviously you did, you know, your your, your mentorship or your coaching with um, the hard, the hard hat? Hard hat yeah? developers, yeah. Hard hat yeah. developers, that's it, with the hard hat developers. Um, what do you think though you took as transferable skill sets from your your nine to five organization i think budget management mm. people skills so being i've been in construction for how many years i'm so used to going into meetings in the boardroom and then back into meetings on site so i can you know mm. bring myself up and down that's something my mom taught me from a young age is always have your telephone voice so mm. be you you know you can be your cockney essex girl but you know you can Actually, Essex, I'm going to take that away because I'm not Essex. East London girl, I'm going to retract that, cut that out. Um, but you've got to have your telephone voice. So I think it is, it's, yeah, dealing with people, doing my own house, combination of things. Um, and what was your, from doing that project for yourself, what were like the main differences you learned from dealing with large scale sort of projects versus like something... That albeit still is a big project in terms of monetary value, yeah. but relatively speaking, a lot smaller scale. Yeah. Um, what did I learn? Learn don't trust people. Mm. Don't trust people. Nobody is gonna care about your product as much as you do. Mm -hmm. Not your builder, nobody you work with is gonna care um in at the same level that you do. Don't trust people. I lost a decent five figures by overpaying my builder and trusting him with funds that he eventually ran off with. Um he didn't finish my project, so I had to pull people in, asking for help. Mm -hmm. Okay, it reminded me that never be too proud. You've got to ask for help, whether that's financial, physical, whatever it is, reach out to people. Um, but I think, it, yeah, for me, it was just, it's not easy. It's not passive, but it's fun. It's it so fun. fun. It's you know so what? good. You know, I, I love it. I don't talk about that enough. 
Oh, so I get so locked good. into the, oh yeah, the lessons and the this, the that, or whatever. But if you love what you do, you'll find a way to make it work. I that don't... as much as when people are, like, oh, you could do this, you could do that. There's all these things. Like, I genuinely am just enjoying property. Like I love creating spaces. I love seeing something come from like, I've bought a house that's had half a roof that looks inhabitable. Like yeah. the most recent one I did that I put on the socials yeah. was being used to grow weed <laughs> yeah. to, like, you know, and now is two amazing luxury flats. And I think if you love what you do, you're going to find a way to make it work because there's passion there. And you got to have fun. Why, mm. why would you do something and not have fun? Mm. And I think again, people focus too much on, yeah, I'm just going to make me this much money. Mm. It's going to make me that much money. It's going to, it's going to stress you out. Like yeah. I cried so much. <laughs> I probably haven't cried that much since I was a baby. <laughs> I cried. I was snappy. I, you know, I was horrible to my boyfriend. I was horrible to my family. I, I didn't sleep properly, but there was still, I, I still overall really enjoyed the process and I learned so much. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the key thing. Like if, if, if the project was too small and I didn't learn anything, then all right, cool. It might make me a bit of money, but where, where's the fun? Where's the, yeah. where's I think, do you know what? And you say, and, and this, this is the great thing Like for me sometimes, like these conversations, as much as like, I love to learn about like different people's journeys. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great value for those that like tune in and listen. Like for me, it's like just a little low key free, free therapy. It reminds me, yeah, just enjoy the fun because it's going to be stressful. Like if I said like, oh, you try and do one project and you're like, okay, you know, I want to ramp it up now. Now I want to do two. Now I want, like, mm -hmm. you're constantly going to be like, if you're trying to push boundaries, you're always going to be up in your stress levels. Yeah. And you have to remember that. I'm in this because I like it. I think if something's only about the money, at some point you burn out. So you yeah. have to try and find, you don't have to love every part of it. Don't get me wrong. Like, oh, yeah. do I love mm. <laughs> no, no, reminding no. builders that actually nine o'clock means nine o'clock? Mm -hmm. And just because you've got a dentist appointment that you knew about two months ago and didn't tell me about, like, do I love the admin? No, but it's like, I love the other side of it enough to get, the job done yeah and it's the end result isn't it mm -hmm. yeah i think my my builder in you know the last six months of the project had about four mot's on his van mm -hmm. wasn't turning off i was just like yeah <laughs> what what do i say to this you know at this point what do i do i sack you i'm halfway mm -hmm. for a for a project um but yeah it, it's it's a long-term thing there's always going to be struggle throughout it and that's what makes it worth it i think one of the good pieces of advice i got once was something has to sort of scare you and excite you Mm -hmm. in almost equal measure if it only excites you it's not you know it, it's not a big yeah. enough opportunity yeah. if it completely scares you it's probably too much yeah. but if something excites you and scares you in equal measure then that's it's a, probably the right opportunity that's a good bit of advice one thing i would say off the back of what you just said though is whether it's like you call it your gut whether it's you call it red flags mm -hmm. but sometimes you just gotta cut your losses so where if you see something is going potentially wrong there is mm -hmm. a point where you step in and say you know what is it going to cost me some money but i'd rather just put an end to it here cut my losses and do something else i think um i had that with like a plumber on a recent project that i was just like it was constantly like yeah i'll be there tomorrow at a certain mm -hmm. point i said you know what don't worry about the work you've done to part pay you today gonna get somebody else yeah. on board because that constant i didn't turn up got other people on site they're now getting paid dead i just said look i can see where this is going yeah and it's gonna cause more problems so i'd rather take i'd rather manage a 500 pounds loss mm -hmm. than have to worry about you know a full figure loss uh, and upwards down the line yeah and I, I i think yeah i think i think looking back if i'd had more time i mean my career was taken off i was traveling more and i really wanted to be able to trust trust this guy and i could up to a point you know he'd done a fantastic job the finish was great he he was working at a really fast pace and then you know sort of started running out of money started yeah. doing stuff with the money but ultimately it's still my fault i could sit here and say oh you know i'm so hard, hard done by my builders run off with 30 40 grand of my money and oh i'm a victim it's my fault I, yeah. I overpaid him. I was the one throwing money at him. I wasn't managing properly. It's my it's my project. It's my responsibility. I can be like, I mean, oh, these yeah, nasty people. still know. hope people are better. You though. do. Like, we, you we, do we hope. To, we don't want to be too pessimistic, but there's there's a balance of, like you said, could have managed the payments better. 
what was in the contract, make sure that that gives you enough protection. Yeah. And I think it's those things that particularly with guidance we learn and mm -hmm. which was, you know, shameless plug, but which is why I set up the PBK community because when I thought about what I would want starting out, it's like access to people that have been there and done it. Yeah. Like a sounding board and just like, you know, a few resources, whether it be loan templates, like, um, you know, schedule of work templates just to give you the level of security that okay look I've, I've got my foundations in place and I can now go with confidence that I'm starting on a stable footing yeah and I wish you know one of my regrets is that I parted ways with the hard, hard hat um ladies too soon mm -hmm. I thought right I've got my project now I know yeah. what I need to know right let's go and I didn't take them on that journey mm -hmm. with me and something like the PBK community would have been perfect so I could have been like you know there were questions and I was just I was just listen Every day is great. Like even sometimes, like I'll just have the most random question. I'll be just like, um, <laughs> by the way, and sometimes it like just because we've got an accountant, it's like, by the way, can I expense my gym membership? You mm -hmm. know, it's like, well, no, <laughs> unless you class like your career as like you know the aesthetic being important. I was like, I do kind podcasts. Of, yeah, kind said, of. No. I was like, Fair <laughs> it's, like this little, it's worth a try. Yeah, worth a try. It's always worth a try. Ask, you know, ask the expert. Yeah, you know? yeah. But yeah, obviously more pertinent questions in terms of does this layout work? Mm -hmm. what, what would your preference be between, you know, this shape room and that shape room when you have options in HMOs? And it's always just nice to have people or just to be like to blow off some steam and to it, describe like your story might save five other people five figure sums down the line. I hope so. And, and vice versa. So, yeah. so hopefully you sharing this will remind people, pay people based on progress. Mm -hmm. have a proper you know contract with a schedule of works linked to progression and where possible get a personal recommendation see existing contracts or existing clients and also if possible check them out on company's house just to see where they're where they're at check them out on work. company's house if you're if you're investing in a certain area mm -hmm. go on to the local facebook group mm -hmm. so in hindsight i've gone onto the facebook group of the area investing search my builder's name about four people that he's done over for money. You can, I think you can search whether people have got CCJs. Mm -hmm. I would do all of that now. Like I'm, yeah. I'm going to have your, you know, I'm going to know your great grandmother's name <laughs> if you're working for me next time. Honestly, I think you really should. Yeah. Not just look at the work, not just recommendations, but search them out. Yeah. And then, oh, and trust your gut. Like that's a, like, yeah. I'm a foot like now every tenant that has ever like wound me up or not paid rent or gone into mm -hmm. it was the tenant that was on 70 grand a year, but had a bad feeling about it for yeah. some reason. So yeah, I just definitely say trust your gut. So what's what's next for Meg then? What's next for that property girl in both, you know, inside of work, outside of work? What are your sort of goals, plans for the near future? Do you know what, as I said, I'm not one of these sort of five year people. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have a plan. I'm I'm loving my career at the moment. It, it's only gonna get bigger. And, and for me, that's the priority to stick mm -hmm. with that. In terms of the investment side, I think now is a good time to buy a property. I think with my sort of long-term view, I'm hopefully I'll get another property this year, whether it'll be a HMO or something that big or something a bit smaller for a bit of cash flow. I'm, I'm, I'm yet to decide, to be honest. I'm just, I'm just enjoying things. I'm just, I'm recovering from the last one. Yeah. Just taking a moment to breathe. Um, Final question before I let you run away. Would you ever consider, because you've got like, obviously like a, a wealth of experience mm -hmm. now, like, and for people that maybe wanted to get into your line of work, would you ever consider like mentoring yourself or like letting somebody shadow you? Is that something that yeah. you'd be open to? Yeah. Because I always get asked and I'm like, obviously I don't have the facility for a lot of different people, mm -hmm. but I'd definitely say make sure you reach out to me and I potentially, if you are looking in your space and think, you know, I think there's a lot that you could teach somebody. Um, I'm going to try, I'm trying to make connections to make this as valuable as possible for people. Yeah, absolutely. And even, you know, whether it's a long-term mentorship or whether it's, you know, a co couple of coffees yeah. over the space of a few weeks, I'm, I'm more than happy, happy to share that, especially for people that don't think they can go into the corporate world or they can't achieve these things. I'm, I'm happy to talk about my experience and how I found it. And I think particularly, obviously we always look at like representation, whether it be like from ethnicity or gender. And I think, mm -hmm being able to showcase like different representations in areas that do have a high they're not that diverse sometimes yeah i think it's good so i'm, I'm glad that you're happy to commit to that and we've got Absolutely. you on camera there in it as well yeah <laughs> so last one how can people find you connect with you um in, in the social space so instagram that dot 
property.girl, mm -hmm. um, LinkedIn, Megan Higgins. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hit me up, so connect got, with me. and we, we got the full name out got there. Got the full the name out there. At the beginning yeah. of the podcast, you <laughs> said, don't say my full name. But if you were gracious and great enough to stay with us till the end, then you managed to get Meg's full name. Um, that has been another episode of the Property by Kazi podcast. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe. We're currently on 10K at this point. So now we just got to add a zero, race to 100K. Um, like this video. If you've got any comments, questions, let us know. And we'll be back next week for another amazing episode.